Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I bought my first cell phone in 1992. It was a Motorola flip phone, and the battery weighed about two pounds on it. It worked well, though, because it was so nice as I was in Chicago that uh, I could make phone calls with it without having to stop at a pay phone if I was out traveling around or if somebody needed to get a hold of me, they could, they could call me. And I remember when it was a couple of years later and it was time to upgrade the, my phone because, well, they were weighing a lot less then. And uh, I went in and I'm at the store and I'm looking at all the various phones and the salesman it keeps telling me I need to get a phone with a camera. And I said, I don't need a camera. I have a camera. I just want a phone to make phone calls. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, I did walk out of the store with just a phone. I didn't need a camera. Well, my latest phone that I got in December uh, before I went on my vacation to, to Disney World, I, I needed it, not because, well, my other phone was quite old, but I could still make phone calls with it, I could still text with it, but it didn't have a whole lot of memory, and it was filled up, and I wasn't able to take pictures with it anymore. So I needed to get a new phone so I could take pictures and send them back to my family and uh, of the good time that I was having. And the crazy thing is, that probably the amount of time I spend on this actually with it up to my ear talking to somebody is minimal. And you're all nodding your heads going, yeah. Usually when I'm talking to someone, it's FaceTime so I can see them and I can look at them while I'm talking to them. Uh, but, you know, the, I use my phone so much more to check the weather, check the news, check the email, set it as an alarm clock for in the morning. Uh, this morning I used it to time my sermon before I, as I was practicing, I do that. I use it for a GPS so I can find out where people are living. Uh, Google things when stuff comes up. Uh, it, you know, it goes on and on and on. And there's so much, and then there's so many different apps. I don't have that many apps. I have limited number of apps, but there's so many different apps that you can get. There's so much stuff, and I know there's more on this than I'll ever figure out how to use. And there are times when I'm with other people and they're doing something with their phone or they tell me about something, and I'm like, how do you do that? And then they show me, I'm going, oh, I didn't know it would do that. That's kind of neat. And so keep learning. And I know that I will probably never learn everything there is to know about that phone, uh, but I do want to keep getting to know it better so I can use the different things that are available on it. Okay. The last several weeks we've been talking about uh, prayers of the Apostle Paul and looking at his prayers um, to help us seek to grow in our prayer life, to have a deeper, richer prayer life in, the, in our prayers for others and in our prayers for ourselves. We, we probably spend lots of time praying for people in regards to sicknesses and grief and different uh, tragedies and things that come up in people's lives. And that's all good, and we need to do that. But what else can we be praying for? And as we've looked at these prayers from the Apostle Paul, he prays for even deeper things in regards to people's walk with the Lord. And today, in the prayer that we have before us, his prayer to the, the Ephesians, um, he is praying that they will get to know God better. Get to know God better. And I want to walk through that, that prayer. And so I encourage you to take out a Bible because I'm going to look at some verses here. Page 1818, Ephesians chapter 1. And yes, you can use your cell phone Bible if you have one. Page 1818, Ephesians chapter 1, begins with, with verse 15. And verse 15 starts, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. 
So Paul is thanking God for them, um, that hasn't stopped praying for them, but it starts off with, for this reason. What reason? Well, we have to go back to verses 3 to 14 for that. And so I invite you to turn back a page. Verse 3, I'm not going to read through all of this, but I want to highlight the things, the points that Paul is making in these verses. Verse 3, he's praising God because he blesses us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Verse 5, he adopted us as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins. We have the riches of God's grace. Verse 8, he lavished on us wisdom and understanding. Verse 9, he's made known to us the mystery of his will and his purpose for us in Christ. Verse 10, the last part of it, he brings all things together under one head, even Christ. And then drop down to the last part of verse 13, we have been marked in him with a seal. And that seal is the promised Holy Spirit. In verse 14, guaranteeing our inheritance. There's a lot of stuff there. We could do a sermon in each one of those. Some of those, we could do a sermon series on that. Paul is like just throwing all this stuff. So much there. It's not just Jesus died for you and you're going to heaven. That would be like, here's your smartphone. You can make phone calls on it. There's so much more. So much more. And so Paul says, for this reason, because our God is so great, so incredible, and all the things that he does, for this reason, we're, I'm giving thanks for you for your faith. I'm praising God for your faith and what he has done in your life and how he is transforming you and changing you because of all of these things. And then we come to verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Paul says, I'm praying for you so you may know God better. And that's what he wants you to know as well. Because there's so much about our God, about who he is, what he has done, what he continues to do for us. And he wants us to know this. He reveals himself to us. And so how do we get to know God better? Well, what is Paul praying for? He's praying for the Spirit the Spirit to grant wisdom and revelation. The Holy Spirit who works through the Word of God, who works through the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, who comes to us to reveal to us all that God desires us to know and to help us to grow in that and to understand that. Which is why it's so important for us to be in the Word. Why it's so important for us to be reading scripture. Why it's so important for us to be in worship. Why it's so important for us to be in small groups. Why it's so important for us to be in Bible study. You know, when we're in Bible study or we're in a small group or we're sitting down one-on-one -on -one with someone and we're looking at Bible passages and we're talking about it and someone says, oh yeah, that passage, what it says to me is this, and we go, oh, I never saw it that way before. That's kind of like, oh, that's how you use that on your phone? As God enables us as brothers and sisters in Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit enables us to grow together in coming to know more about our God, as our God has revealed to us through the Word made flesh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and through the written Word as he reveals to us 
what he wants us to know. Verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. That wonderful word, hope. The hope to which he has called us. And as, as Christians, it, it's Christian hope. It's not wishful thinking. It's absolute certainty that it's real for us because of Jesus Christ. The hope that we have as we live on this earth and all the midst of its brokenness and its pain and in anguish we have the hope of of our god and we can trust in him and we know his presence and we know his blessings and his love for us and the hope we have for a future and it's so much more than well i'm going to die and i'm going to go to heaven no what we have waiting for us is the resurrection christ coming again in all of his glory and all the dead who believe in Jesus Christ, raised body and soul, reunited together. And those who are living on the earth at that time, in a twinkling of an eye, change. No more sin, no more disease, no more grief. And we will be given, brought before the Lord Jesus Christ as his perfect, holy bride to the bridegroom. And we will see him face to face. How we long for that. How we pray, come Lord Jesus, come. That's our hope. That's our future. In the midst of everything that's going on here, we know how the story ends. And we know what our future is. And nothing on this earth can take that away. Because Christ has bought it for us. He's paid the full price for us. The last part of verse 18. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Two ways this can be understood. One is the richness of the inheritance that we have, what I just described, all that God has in store for us, all that is ours now and for all eternity. But it can also be understood that we are God's inheritance. And that comes clear from our Old Testament lesson today, where, the, where Moses says to God, Make us your people, your inheritance. And God makes a covenant with them. We're God's inheritance. He paid for it. The blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And that should remind us, and as we seek to know God better, and we want to grow in knowing God better, to know how valuable we are to the Lord how much we are worth, how important we are, his willingness to give his son for us, and how he calls us to be in mission and ministry with him, to share that good news with others, to pray for others that they may come to know God better. And it's when we understand how significant we are to God and the high value he places upon us, it causes us to respond with a desire that we, we want to live up to that. I want to live up to the fact that I'm a child of God. That Christ sacrificed himself for me. That he was willing to be beaten and crucified and laid dead in the tomb. And he rose for me. And that moves us with a desire to, to live as a child of God, to be the hands, the voice, the feet of Christ and the way we live with other people. And because of our sinful nature, we don't do that perfectly. But we still strive for that. As we live in his repentance, as we live in forgiveness, as we come often, as we did at the beginning of the service, confessing our sins, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And we know, we hear the words of forgiveness and we live in that as we do the struggle of life, of living as sinner and saint. 
All because of the love of Jesus Christ. We are God's inheritance as we wait for our great inheritance. Verse 19, Paul focuses on the incomparably great power for us who believe. The incredible power of God that he gives to us. You know, often when we think of the power of God, what comes to mind is, is, is all of creation and us and everything. God just said the word and it was, and yet it's so intricately designed and and here on this earth we're still trying to figure out how everything works and how it all goes and there are some things that we are able to discover and there's other things we haven't been able to understand and don't know why and how can it all work that way and there's even so much more for us to explore and discover God's creation and his power of creation is just beyond all imagination but that's not where Paul goes in this when he talks about the power of God. Instead, when he refers to the power of God, he talks about the fact that he raised him from the dead. Jesus who came and took all of our sin upon himself and was, was beaten and crucified and stabbed with a spear and laid dead in a tomb. Three days later, alive, raised from the dead. The first fruits of all of those who will be raised from the dead. The power of God who defeated the power of sin, death, and the devil once and for all. And then the power of God that he seated him at his right hand. Not a place, but a position of authority. Christ is at the right hand of God and he is over everything. And verse 22 states that and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. God is in control. Christ is in control. He's over everything. Why? For the sake of the church. For the sake of the mission. For the sake of proclaiming the truth of God's love for us in Jesus Christ that others may come to know as we come to know God better, others may come to know God better as well. And that's what we pray for. Just scratch the surface. I could stand up here and go on and on and on and on. And sometimes we hear that comment. You know, you pastors, you go on and on and on. There's so much. And no matter how much we study we'll never graduate we'll never learn everything there is to know about God just like I'm, I'm never going to figure out everything that smartphone is able to do never will I'm going to try we'll never understand everything about God but his desire is he wants us to know him he wants us to grow. And that's why he sends the Spirit who calls us to faith, who keeps us in the faith, who helps us to grow in that faith, who helps us to come to understand more and more about his love in the challenges that we face, in the joys that we celebrate, in every aspect of life, and to know that we have a future that's grand and glorious. And it cannot be taken away from us as we believe and trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we seek to grow in our prayer life like the Apostle Paul, that as we pray, we pray for ourselves and we pray for others, that by the power of the Spirit, we may come to know God better. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.